Welcome to my show, the Total Connector Show. Uh, my name is Kevin Davani. I have a very, very special guest today, uh, Per L. Byland, if I may pronounce it correctly. Uh, I'm really, I must say, I'm, I'm, thank you so much for coming on my show, Per, and um, I'm really overwhelmed when I look at your, um, the works you've published. <laughs> you must be, it must be a full-time job, obviously, <laughs> being a professor, teacher of Austrian economics, and entrepreneurship and strategical management. Could you just please introduce yourself and a little bit about your background and your connection also, your knowledge about Bitcoin and Austrian economics? Well, absolutely. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on your show. Uh, my, my name is Per Byland, like you said. Um, I'm originally from Sweden where I lived my first 30 plus years. Uh, I have previous careers in IT and uh, teaching on two different continents. Now I'm a professor uh, of entrepreneurship primarily at Oklahoma State University. I was a professor before at Baylor. Um, I taught for a little while at the University of Missouri as well. Um, I'm a fellow with the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. Um, I mean, I wouldn't call myself an expert on Bitcoin. I mean, I sort of follow it a little bit, but uh, not more than that. And and I. I guess I would be an expert on Austrian economics. I mean, I taught, I teach a course at Oklahoma State on Austrian economics for undergrads. Uh, I've taught that now for four semesters running. Uh, and I also have a PhD seminar that is, it's not purely Austrian economics, but it is uh, probably 90% Austrian economics and some classical economists in there as well. So, I mean, that's definitely what every, every waking hour when I don't work on the stuff I have to work on, I do Austrian economics, basically. Fascinating. Well, let me, um, if I may, to show uh, for a minute. Um, okay, this is your Twitter handler. Is uh, uh, anyone who might want to follow you at, at Pear Byland? Then you have, um, then I have this page, entrepreneur.com, mm -hmm. where you are sort of also a, a columnist. You write, right? Uh, yes. Really, very fascinating articles about entrepreneurship. Uh, you wrote a you know, number of books. Uh, to be honest with you, I haven't had the time to read them yet, but it seems very promising. And then you have your own page, um, your own website, uh, and, and it says your research is in the intersection of entrepreneurship, strategic management, and economics of organizations and institutions on pairbyland.com. Uh, uh, com. Mm -hmm. Now, I've listened to a couple of your interviews and podcasts. Uh, I guess it was in connection with uh, Mises Institute. One of them was about anarcho uh, capitalism, and the other one was about uh, competition. And uh, just listening to you, also the keywords that I, that I heard, you know, about um, consumers, the wants and desires. I mean, I'm just paraphrasing in my own words. Um, the wants and desires of the consumers um, and you know how to how to create value for the consumers and now before I get to my core question what do you think uh, Per uh, first of all um, you know I'm, um, the, the reason my show is called the Total Connect I want to break down some of the things that might be a little bit too intellectual academic uh, uh, maybe even scientific. Why, first of all, my question, my primary question is why have we never been taught uh, the, not even the principles of Austrian economics in school or not to mention, you know, students at the, I, I studied law, I'm a law graduate, you know, I have a PhD in law, but I never studied economics. Why is that so? Well, I, that's, a, that's a good question. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I think it goes back uh, many decades. I mean, Austrian economics was one of the three main streams in the 20s and 30s, uh, basically until John Maynard Keynes published his, his uh, awful work in 1936. I mean, the Austrians have been very influential, but then a lot of things happened. You had the Great Depression, uh, you had the New Deal, you had another world war. Uh, so it was basically a perfect storm. And, you know, of course, in a, in a world war, a, you have a war economy and it's all centrally planned. Uh, the government decides what can be produced and what cannot because you need to, or at least the government thinks you, that you need to um, focus on producing bombs and guns. 
uh, and then you basically uh, force people to work on stuff that the government thinks is necessary. And then you need a, an army of people who can calculate exactly how many how many guns can we get out of the steel that we're producing every year? And and I mean, it's any war economy is total central central planning in a sense. And after that, at least in the United States, uh, I mean, after World War II, the United States emerged as uh, the superpower next to the Soviet Union, uh, and and that's when. Uh, the United States started investing a lot in higher ed. Um, so you had the the GI Joe Bill, which simply meant that all the soldiers coming back from the war, they had the chance to go to college and get a degree, which of course meant a, a huge expansion in higher education. And who do you hire for economics departments uh, when you need to hire a lot of professors suddenly? Well, you hire the people who have been serving in government as central planners. So in a, in a sense, Austrians were crowded out. Um, and I mean, this, this is part of the story. The, another part is simply the, the wish in the social sciences in general and in economics in particular for to be scientific. And to be scientific means you use uh, data, you try to predict exactly what's gonna happen. Uh, rather than try to understand. And Austrian economics has always tried to understand what is going on. Um, and si Austrian economics simply says that the economy is so complex that we can't say exactly what's going to happen. We can't say that raising the minimum wage by this or that many dollars is going to cause unemployment by 0.3% or something. We, we can't say that. That's That's impossible to say. What we can say is simply that compared to not doing it, we would have effects going in this direction. Uh, and, and of course, if you're a policymaker, uh, if you're a decision maker in government, you want those exact predictions. You, you don't want someone saying that, well, you know, it, it depends on this, it depends on that. And I, I think it was uh, the American president, Harry S. Truman, um, who exclaimed once that he wanted an, a one-armed uh, economist and why? Because economists were used to saying, well, if you get a question, it's well on the one hand, on the other hand. <laughs> so that's why you wanted a one-armed economist, because then you, there's only one hand. Right? You wanted a straight answer. And uh, I would say that a true economist can't give you a straight answer, because you, you can't predict. It, it depends on so many things. And everything is sort of interconnected in the economy, that if one thing changes, many other things will change too. So you can't say exactly, but you can understand the process and what, what is going on. So it, it, with all of these things happening at once, I mean, with economists being hired by government, and you can sort of guess that the Austrians were not standing in line to be hired by government as central planners. Um, and then the expansion in academia, of course, hiring the people who were serving in government and then this sort of bias towards uh, a natural science type social science all of these things mean that austrian economics is eh, per se it was, it was old stuff right? it's not very interesting stuff so i think that is the reason why austrian economics is not really considered anymore <laughs> excuse me and i mean it's also the problem with being scientific in the sense that economists are and actually all social scientists nowadays is that they subscribe to uh, what has been called the Whig theory of science where where the recently the, the recently published articles and books they sort of capture everything that is worth knowing and whatever was whatever balls we dropped in the in the past they were not worth juggling right those those insights we, we've gotten farther than that in that sense so we know better now so whatever we forgot in the past we forgot for a good reason um so if you approach a non-austrian economist today they would probably say that well i mean the austrians they had good uh, contributions but they've all been incorporated in economics the way it is today so we don't we don't need austrian economics they they've already played their role and that that's it and what, what we need now is just better methods and more data and whatnot else mm -hmm. 
Very, very interesting. So um, now, if it wasn't for Bitcoin, uh, Pierre, I wouldn't have probably, you know, dealt or or really gone into the rabbit hole of every aspect and facet there is to Bitcoin. I mean, there's not a single aspect or facet of Bitcoin which, you know, you, you don't, you cannot deal with it. It's like, you know, economics, monetary, uh, cryptography, uh, uh, so, sociology, <coughs> philosophy, uh, finance, uh, the, you know, the normal mechanism of the market um, and what is, and then what is money? Uh, that's like the, the, I mean, that's like such an enlightening, I'm not the first one, I'm, I'll be definitely not the last one to say this. It's such an enlightening uh, voyage, a trip into this uh, dimension of Bitcoin because for the first time in my life, and I'm sure a lot of other people would confirm that, they understand, they comprehend for the first time what is money, how it is created, and what's the chain reaction when you have that sort of money, as in whatever, in Keynesianism, infinite central banking, mm. uh, printing of money, and you've got, for example, as in the 19th century, the gold standard, hard money. I didn't even know that. Um, so mm -hmm. this is why what shocks me a little bit, how deep is the brainwashing has been going on? Mm. Well, very deep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Many people don't, I mean, we, we just assume that things the way they are is normal and that's, it, it needs to be that way for a reason. There, there's a reason why we have a central bank, because obviously, as the central bank tells us, uh, the economy would not function without the central bank. So not knowing any better, we would just assume that it's right. Why would they lie? Right. But I, I don't think they're lying. I think they're, they're presenting parts of the truth that fits with their interests. Right. So, uh, and if, if their aim is to centrally plan the economy and steer it, or at least direct it, nudge it in, in whatever direction they, they think is preferable for some reason, then having a central bank makes it a whole lot easier. Uh, you, I mean, you don't have to be conspiratorial to see that, well, depending on where you want to go and <laughs> what, what your goal is, it, it might not be a bad idea. And it's, it's always, we always struggle with this problem that letting things be and let them sort themselves out and, and finding sort of a natural order of things. Um, that's really hard to argue for because it's a, it's an advanced argument. I mean, the, is there a balance in the free market? Well, most people see that, well, there are recessions, there are problems, there are uh, companies exploiting workers. There are some people getting filthy the rich, whereas others are struggling. They see all these things and they, they blame that on the market, but, if you want to explain what is actually going on, you need to first introduce them to uh, market economics to understand how the market process works, what entrepreneurship actually does, what trade does, what the price represents. Uh, <clears throat> you need to talk about capital, what the, the role of capital is and where the consumer fits in all this and what, what investments mean and the, what does it mean when consumers consume less and save more and all these things? You need a, a, a fundamental and, and rather deep understanding for the system to begin with. And then you can start to add regulations and talk about, okay, what, what are the actual effects when you add this type of regulation on the market system itself? But you lost them a long time ago. And it, if they are at all listening, right? Because it, it takes a long time. There, there are no slogans or one-liners uh, for understanding uh, emergent or sp spontaneous orders and a natural order. I mean, it, it often requires a leap of faith in a sense to, to uh, just accept it based off of a very, very short statement, right? I mean, it's very easy to say government should do this or government should fix the problem because then you have a, a, a central power and you know that it has power uh, and, if you don't know better, you think that it can just enforce whatever you want to and then solve the problem because we can all see the problems, right? And, and then, but just sitting back and saying that, no, 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 let, let that power be, let's, let, let power take a step back and, and let people sort this out themselves. It seems a little far-fetched, right? If you don't understand uh, the, the market process itself. 
So that's it's it's really hard to argue this. I mean, imagine if you're in in a television debate on CNN or something. I mean, they're they're throwing slogans at each other, right? They're slow. They're it's all about the one liner, and they all come back to the same one liner at least twenty times in an interview. If you have to explain the whole system and how it works and how everything fits together and it's interdependent and all this stuff, that there is no way you're going to win that debate. Mm-hmm. You, you might in the classroom. I mean, if if you teach a course for a full semester or even several courses then you can go through all the details and show how they fit together and and then the student can make up their minds if they if they believe it if they think it's true or not but but at least then you have a chance to explain how the economy functions as an economy not not as something else fascinating so uh, Pierre, do you do you see what is I mean what is then if we can if you could if you had the power to transform the system like from the root upwards would that be the monetary root layer as I would call it um, like going back let's say really to a fully hundred uh, percent you know backed currency or a gold standard a pure gold standard or Bitcoin would that be you know, the ultimate solution to trigger, you know, the chain reaction of these processes? Well, I mean, it depends on if you're looking for one specific policy. I mean, I, I guess one thing would be simply to push the button and then all everything government disappears. I mean, that would, <laughs> that would be a solution, <laughs> right? Uh, but if, in terms of one policy, I mean, sound money would be a very effective policy, I think. And the reason is, is pretty simple. In any transaction, one party or any, one side of any transaction is money mm-hmm. in the whole economy. So, of course, if you meddle with money, you meddle with every transaction. So stop meddling with money. That means most, most transactions are going to be a whole lot more sound than they were before. And you're going to have signals through the price system and so forth that are reliable, which they're not today. Right. So. In that sense, I mean, there's a reason why most Austrian economists are very interested in money and and banking and that sort of thing because it's it is so fundamental for how the economy works. Money is so core to a, a market economy. Uh, there's a whole lot more to it, of course, but I mean, if if you have to choose one policy that you want to change, then get rid of uh, central banking and funny money. That would be it. You know, I wonder sometimes um, for a trans for a structural transformation, which we urgently need. Um, uh, sometimes I wish we would stop talking about Bitcoin, and people because there are two sorts of people: either they have the pain points, they feel the pain points, such as in Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, Argentina, with inflation, hyperinflation, uh, unemployment. I mean, really a chaos. And we have the other part of the world, sort of so-called uh, whatever developed modern, uh, you know, as as we, as I'm in Austria, people don't feel it. It's they're still comfortable. Uh, why? Yeah. Why should they? You know, why should they go to Bitcoin? And that's what the people are telling us. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I can I can pay my coffee. Yeah, no, it's a problem. You know, they have no real like felt like inflation. It, there's no pain. So either I think people need to feel the pain like feel the experience the existential financial monetary or you know collectively as i would say uh, they need to understand what's the potential what what can we really and that's uh, you know leads me to my core question there is this chapter um in you know it's a fade and a moose book the bitcoin standard on page 96 and he scratches the surface for me, and it's a really good chapter, but he just scratches the surface. It's this, um, the, the comparison between the 19th and 20th, 20th century, 19th century, the gold standard, 20th century, you know, fiat money and, and central planning and, and, and stuff like, and there's some, and he's, he quotes or cites some studies from Jonathan Hübner, a possible declining trend for worldwide innovation, technological forecasting, and then uh, from Peter Thiel, uh, from, uh, from zero to one. And the basic message, the core message is, before I, you know, I rant on over here, is that, um, is that in the 19th century under the gold standard, there were much more original sort of innovations as, you know, compared to the 20th century. So I'm thinking, you know, 
I'm asking myself in the end, at the end of the day, what's the purpose? Why, why Bitcoin? I mean, what do we want to achieve? And you talked about in your, in your interviews, in your podcast and listen to, you talked about comfort and giving value to consumers and, you know, to the society in, in large and leisure time and all that. But for me, it's also about, you know, an evolution which we probably cannot even fathom or imagine, let alone comprehend at this stage. I'm talking about technologies which might, you know, and it's still, it's definitely, we don't even go to conspiracies, but have, have been suppressed. Because um, Safed Anamu says, you know, uh, that in the 20th century, there's been sort of uh, uh, optimization of, of old innovations. So, uh, I do, I do think and I do know that there are technologies that have been developed, but not just for the benefit of us, of us humanity or as a society. It's either been developed or, you know, whatever, suppressed a patent system you got on that, on that side. It's a theft system, in my opinion, in my honest opinion. And then you've got, on the other hand, you know, a military industrial complex, a corporate military industrial complex. So I'm, uh, I think my, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is that why, what do you think would happen if we had a gold standard or we had a sound, scarce as hard as money that would really trigger, initiate this process of everything you've been, you know, you, you're actually teaching about? Well, I, I think what you're talking about is really that the whole economy is not really directed towards satisfying consumers. <laughs> it is doing something else. I mean, consumers are satisfied to some extent, but what we're talking about as an economist, it's the difference between what could be done and what is being done. And what you're saying is simply that, well, under a sound money regime, which is the gold standard or Bitcoin or whatever it is, something that is not manipulated, uh, in that type of economy, the whole economy can, to a much greater extent, be directed towards what consumers actually want. I mean, the whole point of production is to satisfy consumers. The whole reason uh, that entrepreneurs do what they do is because they benefit by providing value to consumers. That's what they do. And all of production, all the development of capital and of technologies and all of these things, they're all directed to the one same thing. You want to benefit yourself and get that gain through profits and whatever. And the only way of doing that is to prov provide consumers with something that they value even higher than what others value, uh, what other alternatives that they, they value. Right? And what we're doing now, I mean, you mentioned the indust military industrial complex. They are devouring a lot of resources, producing a lot of stuff that are not at all directed towards consumers but, and consumer wants, but right? they're directed towards rich people basically are the owners of those companies and they're directed to wars wars are not for consumers either um therefore the political class because they want to do something that win an election or they want to expand their empire or whatever it is um but that's not value i mean the austrian economics is unique in the sense that it starts with consumers and say that the only value there is, it has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with the numbers of dollars and whatnot. It all has to do with the living standards of real people, ordinary people. That is consumers, because we all, we all consume. And the whole economy is, in a sense, struggling to figure out how to use the resources that we have in the best way possible to satisfy consumers. And of course, there, there's no contradiction in this. You, you can meddle with the system, but you can hardly optimize it. You, you can't refine it and make it better because you have all those thousands and millions of, of entrepreneurs trying to figure out how to invest their own money to benefit themselves by providing value to consumers. And of course, they're, they're, they might suffer a loss. They might lose everything if they're wrong, and they might get super rich if they're really right and no one else is. But that profit and loss system, th there's no contradiction in this. If you're, if you're bad at predicting or imagining what consumers will want, you're going to lose everything. Those resources are basically released. They're liberated from, from you because you're not good enough. 
and others can take over them and produce for consumers. By what we've seen, I mean, in, in a sense, the 20th century, you have two world wars. There's immense destruction. But I don't mean this destruction only by bombing stuff, which of course is destruction. But there's also destruction because through those wars, the government redirects resources that could have been used to satisfy consumers, whoever they are and wherever they are, and instead produce military gadgets and bombs and defense and offense and all of this stuff. Those resources could have been used to feed people, provide shelter to people, provide them with whatever comfort and convenience that they value, all of this stuff. So on the one hand, they're bombing stuff and destroying capital in an economic sense, like buildings and roads and all of this stuff used in production. They're destroying that and they're using value to destroy value. So they're keeping a lot of value out of the hands of consumers while, and for what purpose? Well, for the purpose of destroying other value. I mean, it's, it's a double loss, that's what it is. Wars are simply not economical. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, Pierre, uh, do you think that this whole system is seemingly made complex, in, but actually it's very simple, <laughs> like to break it down, like from if, if we go to the roots of all these problems, the symptoms, you know, all the structures that we have right now, um, this is what I'm contemplating about. And and Bitcoin, you know, might be the one triggering thing. This is, I have so much hope in Bitcoin because maybe really this is the first time we have a totally decentralized monetary, you know, store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account. And it's not controllable. It is unconfiscatable. It is not manipulatable. Um, so, um, and you quoted, you know, but before I forget, you've quoted in one of your um, interviews, uh, Henry Ford. <laughs> that was such a hilarious. You said he was asked if, like, sort of, uh, Henry Ford was asked, well, why don't you ask the consumers? And he, and he said sort of, can you, can you, I'm not sure whether I can paraphrase that correctly. He says something yeah, about the horses. Something to, to the <laughs> fact of had I, had I asked my consumers, they, my, my customers, they would have wanted better, uh, faster horses. Exactly. Not automobiles. And I mean, Steve Jobs has some quote similar to that, that sometimes consumers simply don't know what they want until they see it, which means the entrepreneur has to provide it and basically place it in front of your, your very nose. And then you say, oh yeah, right. That, that's a good thing. I can, I can make lots of use of this and this is really convenient, but you would never imagine it yourself. So the entrepreneur has to imagine that for you. And if if the entrepreneur if the entrepreneur has access or the possibility, the realistic possibility, to accessing, uh, let's say, you know, the solution or the the the, the methods, the, the the technology, the innovation, the ID, to you know to convert that into a real product. But I'm like, I'm thinking. Uh, you know, it's very peculiar. The more I think about it, for more than what 100, 150 years, we've been, we still have uh, burning fuels, uh, combustion <laughs> engines. Mm -hmm. On all other levels, we have pretty much exponential, you know, sort of evolution, technological innovations. And I'm like, why is that? Uh, of course, I mean, I know the answer, but uh, what is needed? What is required structurally from the root upwards? Is it, could it be that people, instead of complaining about politics, they, maybe they should just stop voting the same system, the same structure that carries all the political parties, you know, the same in Austria. What would happen if 30, 40, 50% of people just would stop voting? Would that change something and, and simply go to Bitcoin? Well, potentially. I mean, you're, you're withdrawing support, I suppose. And I mean, it depends on when, when, when the state uh, loses legitimacy in the eyes of people, I guess. Uh, and when that happens, who, who knows? But I mean, what I would argue is the problem we're dealing with now, when you mentioned entrepreneurs and technologies and things like that is, is that the economy is sort of arbitrary because there are so many things, uh, that are, are affecting the economy and how it works. And there are arbitrary boundaries, um, 
and regulations and manipulations uh, that are so plentiful that you can't really predict much and you can't see the sort of natural flow of the economy. So that makes it really, really hard for entrepreneurs to imagine what is possible and what to build from, right? I mean, there, there are some, when we teach entrepreneurship, we teach that you should start with getting a patent because that makes it sort of safe. Um, and you should always have an idea or create a moat around your company and things like that so that you can continue to uh, ex exploit the idea and, and your, your market position for profits so that no one else can. And I mean, that, that, that's true. That's how an individual hmm. entrepreneur should act because you need to cover your expenses. You need to, you need to make a profit because otherwise it, it, it's pointless. Uh, so, so that's definitely true. But all of these things affect everybody else too. So because you cannot use this technology and instead you have to try something else, well, that means resources are redirected to something that is not the, the, the highest value. And then there's a regulation and then there is a license and then there, you can't really trust money. And then all of these things and different policies and new policy every day. And this creates sort of a, a hopeless situation if you're trying to uh, produce for the future, which is what entrepreneurs try to do. They, they all try to meet the future uh, in the sense that they're imagining what consumers will want at some some point in time, and then they produce goods and services so that they can provide those when they think consumers are ready for them or, or when they will benefit the most, right? So timing and, and figuring out what people will want, and at the same time beating all the other entrepreneurs to the punch. So that you're, you're, you're providing something that is better, more valuable in the consumer's eyes, of course, um, and at a probably a little sooner than everybody else, and then you make a profit. Well, in a, in a completely free market, the only changes that would be would be people's tastes and other entrepreneurs entering the market and trying to compete with you. Mm -hmm. But everything is still directed towards satisfying consumer wants, right? So everything is still directed in at the same thing and going the same way. Everybody's trying different things, of course, but on a principle level, that's it. It's sort of a much simpler system. But today with all these regulations, everything, there, there are arbitrary boundaries to every action, which means that you can't really trust much at all and, and you, can't, you can't foresee much at all. So it's much more of a short-term game than it's should be or would be without all these regulations. So I would say that entrepreneurship is so much harder today than it should have been. Yeah. And that, that goes back to what you said before, that, that there was all these innovations that when you refer to the book in, in the 19th century, and you had all these development and things like that with, uh, and at the same time you had sound money. Why didn't we have that in the 20th century? Well, part of it is because entrepreneurship is, to some extent arbitrary now and there's a whole lot more that depends on luck and to be an insider in the political system and so forth and that means that the system itself the economy itself is so much more short term and it doesn't matter all that much anymore if you actually satisfy consumers you have to do that to some extent but then you have to fit uh, in the system and all the regulations and everything you have to go through all those hoops in order to be able to produce, which means if you actually go through those, those hoops and, and waste all those resources doing that, no one else might be able to compete with you because they have not been able to do that. So they're competing with completely different means today than would have been the case. And I guess you could argue that it was different in the 19th century, and it was to some extent, but it certainly wasn't a completely free market in the 19th century. But since money uh, policy was sound uh, to a much greater extent, you had much less arbitrariness. So it was easier to be an entrepreneur in that sense, because all you needed to do was think about, do I provide value to consumers? Is my value great enough 
that other entrepreneurs don't stand a chance against me when I launch this product. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. So do you see, I mean, is there, would you say there's, we really urgently need um, a structured process, like an order of, of things that need to happen. Um, of course, I always, you know, would like you to make maybe the connection to Bitcoin, which, I mean, do you envision that? What if, what if we have an exponential rate of speed in the mass education, mass adoption, mass internalization of Bitcoin within, you know, Earth's population? Let's say we have until 2024, 2025, three to four billion people. I mean, that's like a wish dream. And my second question is uh, maybe a little bit separate from that. How much government do we really need? <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen when, when people start abandoning the sort of a monopolistic currencies that we have today. In a sense, we're already seeing that they're being undermined in different ways, right? I mean, uh, in, in Europe, you have the euro um, as an attempt to get rid of the fluctuations between currencies that are really created because they're not backed by gold anymore. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a made up problem in a sense. Um, and then you, you lift that problem and the decision-making power to a supernatural, supernatural level. Uh, and then you just pretend that that problem doesn't exist. Uh, of course it still exists, uh, whenever you trade with, and you have euros and someone else does not, then <laughs> the same problem is still there. Um, so I mean, in that sense, that, that, that can only go one direction and that's a world currency. Uh, if you want to solve those problems, well, and that's, that's a political problem. And I, I have no idea where, where we might be heading or, or if it's even desirable for anyone, but I suppose it could be. Then a super centralized um, currency then. I mean, that's what we're yeah, talking about. Yeah, I mean, right? you, could, you could imagine, I've seen, I've seen someone argue that there should be a world currency that is I don't know, regulated by the, I don't know, IMF or World Bank or some international organization like that, maybe the United Nations. Um, and I mean, that, that would definitely uh, do away with currency fluctuations, right? The exchange rates would disappear since there's only one currency. Uh, and in that sense, it, it would mimic, um, gold as the way it was used before because every currency every every country had their own currency but they were all based in gold so you had fixed exchange rates because gold was the real money everywhere um, so in that sense you wouldn't have uh, exchange rate speculation for instance or problems when exporting or importing because gold is gold and, and you know exactly the, the exchange rate because a a bill or a coin or whatever it, it doesn't matter the number that is on there because it's always denominated in gold anyway so there's the same basis uh so a world currency would solve that problem um it would also give free reign to politicians to print money to um to finance whatever project uh and that that would be problematic and from an austrian point of view i mean expanding credit that's how you start the boom bust cycle that's how you create recessions and depressions. Um, and you could argue that one reason you have recessions and depressions and they happen so soon, quote unquote, is because there are other currencies. So, so when one country does this, pretty soon people find out in the sense that they don't trust the currency anymore or why are there so many uh, bills with this currency? And that exchange that affects the exchange rate and so forth, um, and that's when you get speculation against currencies, like you had in the early '90s. Uh, I remember when I was in Sweden. Then there was speculation against the Swedish currency that was pegged to the European currency unit, um, and it was overvalued according to the the markets. And there was speculation against it, and the Swedish central bank tried to defend it by raising interest rates to 500 percent. Uh, not not by 500 percent, but to 500 percent in November 2000, uh, 1992. Uh, but then they they couldn't defend it anyway, and the currency immediately dropped by 30 percent or something like that. Uh, 
I mean, that's a huge problem if you're if you're a business and you have signed contracts, long term contracts with businesses abroad, and suddenly you know, only going to get paid 70% of <laughs> what you were being paid yeah. because the currency changes. The value of the currency has dropped. Holy crap, what do you do with that? Right? So uh, that's, that's definitely a, a huge problem. But that also means that you cannot inflate the currency a whole lot before the traders in the market uh, realize that something is going on and they start selling that currency. So in that sense, you're, th th there's a, a way out in a sense, right? You, you can't go on for, for too long. But if there's a world currency, there are no exchange rates. So you're not going to figure out that, that they're actually inflating the currency as much. So it could go on for much longer, I think. And that's going to, I don't know where that's going to take us. Maybe it's going to take us to a global hyperinflation, which would be terrible. Um, but, and, uh, I mean, I don't know if we're ever going to get there, but that's sort of one possible scenario, I suppose. And it's, it's very frightening. But that's what Could... the IMF is proposing, right? I mean, they want, they want to get rid, first of all, of all the paper money. I mean, that's what they're sort of brainstorming about a total digital global fiat currency, um, under the control of whatever the central banking structure and with negative interest rates. So, so that means, I mean, then civilization is lost for, in my, in my opinion, because you have digital money in your account so they can just for whatever reasons, first of all, inflate your money or steal from your money and inflate it as, because it's central, it's super centralized. There is, I mean, there is nothing beyond that super centralization anymore, is it? Well, I, I haven't heard the IMF say anything like that. I, I know that the Swedish Central Bank is looking into having a sort of parallel currency as a digital version of the Swedish currency. Um, I also know the Swedish banks are, are avoiding handling cash. <laughs> so they basically want to do only the digital transfers. Of course, that, that, that has the problem that you mentioned that, well, your your money is is basically in, in on somebody else's hard drive and somebody else this, this determines the value of your, your money. Uh, that's problematic. Uh, uh, but uh, I don't know anything about a, a world currency. I can just see that if this would happen, it would be very problematic. Yeah. So what's your vision uh, for the future then? Uh, uh, if we let's say okay, what, what's it? What's your overall vision or or thoughts on Bitcoin and I don't want to call it even blockchain because blockchain has been so overhyped. People don't even probably know. Most people don't even know what blockchain is. But the features that Bitcoin offers as you know as a store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account, totally decentralized, immutable, and not confiscatable. What is there something that you can think of that, you know, what, what would be the circumstances, the conditions that, you know, could improve our lives? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a huge question. Is that a philosophical? I don't want it to be philosophical. I'm thinking of Mises, uh, human action. And I'm like, maybe mm -hmm. something I'm, I'm, I'm I, maybe this is the lack of human action I see. Where's the human action? You know, I mean, we got the conditions. Okay, people don't still don't understand. It's an educational stuff. But once I guess a critical mass of people are educated, really comprehending what's going on behind the scenes and what's the cause, then I think the action comes, you know, out of human behavior and human decisions. You, you mean the action of moving to a different currency? For example. Yeah, it, it could be. And I mean, in, in a sense, all this money that was created by the Federal Reserve since the recession, uh, tens of billions of dollars every month, uh, it's going to have to have some sort of effect on the economy. I mean, where is that money now? It has not created too much of price inflation. Um, so in the se that sense, the, the money has not hit the economy, um, at least not in, in prices of everyday goods. On the other hand, we have a stock market rally with uh, new record levels 
And that's probably because of this injection of, of new money. Mm -hmm. um, will people lose faith in these monies? I have no idea. I mean, it, I, I think eventually, because it isn't money, it, uh, I mean, from a strict Austrian point of view, right? That that uh, this is fiat currency. It's not. It's not a money that has been accepted uh voluntarily but it's a money that we're forced to use through legal tender tender laws and things like that right uh i mean the law says that you have to accept in the u.s u.s dollars for payment of any debt uh, you're not allowed to not accept it but of course if people stop accepting it and not just sort of me personally but if people a critical mass like you mentioned stop accepting it then the sort of the inherent value in that currency is going to be obvious and it's zero mm -hmm. um, because the, it has value because people just accept it by by habit and because of this law that you are not really allowed to use anything else uh, as soon as if you try something else and you call it money there there's usually a crackdown on that i mean i think there was a I read something about a, the silver dollar or whatever they called it, the Liberty dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and since they called it a currency, uh, it was a, it was called uh, counterfeiting. So they cracked down on it and they took all the silver and everything and, and they, I, they charged the owners and, and whatnot else. I haven't followed that case. I'm not sure what happened, but I know that they stopped um, simply because they, they call it the money and you're not supposed to call it the money because it's a, a money monopoly that the government has through through their central bank. Um, I mean, people are already still accepting Bitcoins and they're using other cryptocurrencies and uh, people are hoarding junk silver. I mean, the, basically the old uh, coins that has a certain certain fraction of the content is actual silver. Uh, so people are buying those up, uh, sitting on them, basically waiting to see what what happens. And it's, it's an inflation hedge in a sense, right? Like just like buying gold or whatever. But if something happens, then at least you have the silver in those coins. Uh, there's something. Um, so I mean, you you have all these other different currencies, and I mean the the central banks are not helping in the sense because what do central banks do? They're buying gold. Yeah. Tons, so yeah, the, hundreds of tons. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 And, and, and at the same time, they're buying gold and they're telling us that no, gold is not money. Well, they're in the business of, of money. <laughs> so why are they buying all this gold? And why are they trading with each other in gold if it's not money? So they, they're telling us one thing and then looking at their actions, they're, it, it's something very different. One would think, you know, people would learn from that, you know, differentiate between easy money, hard money and hardest money or, you know, less scars, more scars, most, you know, scarcest. And this is something I think if that principle I th it would be collectively understood, uh, my opinion, you know, humanity would really take action. Um, and do something about it for themselves, just, you know, out of whatever, out of greed, out of selfishness, out of self-preservation. Um, with everything going on globally, I mean, I know it's a very general question, but what, 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 what kind of process do you see it evolving or unfolding um, economically? Wow. Uh, I really have no idea. <laughs> uh, trying to predict the future, I mean, you shouldn't ask an Austrian about predicting the future because we don't do that. We try to understand what is going on. Um, and I mean, had I been able to predict things, I would probably invest in those things and make a lot of money. And I have not been able to do that. So, <laughs> so you shouldn't trust what I, what I'd say. Um, but, I mean, you can see that there are a lot of, of problems everywhere though. Um, and I mean, money is super important. It's it's not just that yeah you need it in order to buy stuff but well you do but that's what that's the denomination for prices that's how entrepreneurs allocate resources it's how they figure out whether what they're doing is profitable or not 
So we can use and also to have theory. our low type preference, and also to to develop. That's what's lost, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely. Kind of, so right? you can hypothesize that that we don't get money at all. So money disappears. What's going to happen? Well, we're, we're not going to have these uh, long and very specialized production processes anymore. So we have to roll everything back and become a very rudimentary economy. I mean, you can only do uh, very simple things. So you, you can't have world trade. Uh, you, you can't have... Basically, you, know, you can't have employment if yeah. you're in a barter, barter economy because what are you going to be paid in? And every time you need to trade something, you need to figure out who might want what I have and has exactly what I have. The want coincidence have. of wants, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and there, there's no trade. I mean, that's not really much of an economy, which is exactly what Menger was talking about in this old piece from the 1890s. I mean, where, do money, where does money come from? Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's a good uh, in Austrian economics, uh, like any other. It's just that one good that is more saleable or more marketable than other goods. So trying to find that guy who wants what I have and has what I want, that's really hard. And since it is so hard, uh, I might figure out that he wants something that this third guy has. So maybe if I maybe if he wants what I have, I can trade with him and exchange with him. And then I get something that this other guy wants, which makes this other good that I don't actually want, but I acquire because I can trade it with someone that it makes it more saleable and more marketable. And people realize pretty soon that, Hey, that's how you facilitate exchange and get what you want. So obviously they're going to do it. And people are going to trade for the most marketable good. So over time, one or a couple of different goods are going to emerge as the one good that people in general simply accept. Because, hey, basically everybody accepts this good uh, for payment. So we're just going to use it for that. And that's how lots of societies throughout history have have had different types of money. They've had, had money in the form of seashells and cattle and slaves and all these different things mm -hmm. uh, because they have been the most marketable in that type of society. Uh, of course, in the West, most recently, it was gold and silver because um, those were the most marketable goods, but they're still goods. You can still use them for jewelry and in industry and all these things, right? So, and that's where, where Bitcoin is very different from money in the sense that Mises was talking about it and this Rothbard was talking about it because Bitcoin itself is not a good, mm -hmm. right? It's something that is invented and it's on, on your hard drive and well, it's on plenty of hard drives, but oh, the <laughs> it, it's not, it's not something that is useful in industry. The technology itself might be, but yeah. not, not the money. Does that matter? I don't think it does. And the very, the reason is that as soon as you have a money economy and people are used to using money, mm -hmm anything can take money's place as long as people consider it a money. So yeah. just because we don't have gold anymore doesn't mean that we have to start figuring out, oh, what, what, what type of good would I use to exchange with these people? No, you can just, everybody can accept something else as a money. And that's what, what we're sort of seeing with, um, with Bitcoin today, that people are choosing Bitcoin over dollars or over euros. So they are shifting uh, some of their own finances over to a different currency. And that means that it's getting legitimacy as a money. It, At it, least, you know, as a store of value, you know, initially, right? Right. And then that's just speculation, right? So, so you can buy anything speculating that it mm -hmm. will either keep the same value or will increase in value. I mean, that's just an, that's an investment. Mm -hmm. But as a money, I mean, that's, something you use for transactions and exchange. And that's how Bitcoin is being used more and more too. Uh, I mean, you have overstock.com, they accept Bitcoin for, for any uh, exchanges, any transactions, right? So, and people uh, might transfer Bitcoin between each other for payments of debt and things like that. So will it become the money in the sense that it's the number one type of money being used mm -hmm. i have no freaking clue but i mean it, it is already used by a, a lot of people 
at least as a final settlement layer. Would you agree with that? I mean, sort of, you know, to finalize the settlement, uh, the, the, the payments, maybe not even as a medium exchange. What if, you know, it becomes the final settlement layer as, as a real, like harder than gold as a settlement layer, because, because, you know, of the capacities of on-chain transaction, all the limitations that is, you know, is mm -hmm. talked about. It, it is used, used like that. Right. And, mm -hmm. but it's so far, it has had, I think a little bit hard to reach, reach out in the sense that it's, it's, stuck in in the computer type of system right so you have a subset of the population that uses this and and you can't buy anything with bitcoin so you can't go to your nearest convenience store and buy a gallon of milk using bitcoin because mm -hmm. they don't accept bitcoin so mm -hmm. it, it, in that sense it that it comes with limitations mm -hmm. and but since it has gone up in terms of other currencies the value it has provided people with a lot of wealth um, simply because they have, I mean, that's through speculation again, an, an investment and not as a currency necessarily. But I mean, it, it has also started a, a different movement, right? With all these cryptocurrencies, there are, I, I have no clue about the fraction of them. There are so many, um, but it has created something different. And you mentioned IMF uh, talking about having a digital currency of their own. And I know the Swedish central bank, they're talking about having some sort of a digital currency and might be using blockchain as well. Um, I'm not sure why a central bank would want to use a decentralized uh, technology, but. No, it's centralized, but you know, it would be sort of a centralized. I mean, we already have fiat digital fiat currency because yes. what, uh, what is it? 10% is like in total, printed money paper and the rest is actually already yeah, it's not much right so i want to conclude with um i'm not sure whether i can uh, quote hayek the famous austrian economist i think he said some someday in a, during a presentation i don't know when, when it was 70s 80s um that if we can't take the power over the issuance of money out of the hands of the government maybe by sly roundabout uh you know this will uh, happen. So maybe this sly roundabout could be t uh, in reality Bitcoin, who knows. Uh, but um, this is what I'm saying. Uh, my opinion is, would you agree with that? If we, if we tackle, if we solve that problem at the root, the money problem, a lot of other things, not maybe, you know, being solved, but could be facilitated. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it, it, like we talked about before, it is probably the most important uh, institution in the economy for the simple reason that it is half of every transaction all over the place. So, so it, if you solve the money issue, then yeah, you, the whole economy is going to take one giant leap forward in terms of being sound, right? And, and the signals can be trusted and all of these things. So yeah, that would be an important step for sure. And that, that would mean, I mean, why would it be important? <laughs> My saying so is, is not enough, right? Uh, why would it be important? Simply because it would facilitate uh, economic growth. So we would be able to produce a whole lot more wealth mm -hmm. and have much better lives, much higher standards of living, because you would suddenly facilitate entrepreneurship that is value exactly. creative. Right? Exactly. That, is, that, that is the point. It's not yeah. that it's, it's yeah. an Im important or interesting economic problem, but we can actually get more out of the economy and use resources in a, in a sound way for our own good. And finally, you know, having this prosperity, if you, which you often talk about, you know, uh, in whatever yeah. sense and level, um, consumers, societies, civilization in general, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, and, you know, this technological evolution and innovation that, uh, you know, I was going to talk about is, is really fundamental to me. Uh, uh, yeah. Are there any final thoughts, um, a pair, which you want to maybe share with the listeners and viewers? Well, I mean, yeah, in a sense, think about what entrepreneurship is mm -hmm. and what it does. And I, I'll take, if, if there is any chance of studying Austrian economics, and maybe in a guided sense, I mean, you, you could sit down and read human action from cover to cover. Uh, 
most people would probably stop after a while and <laughs> and just never open it again. So I, some guy did sort of tutored uh, taking a course or something like that. But I mean, there are plenty of things like that. I mean, you have the the uh, free market roadshow in all over Europe uh, having uh, different kinds of presentations. You have the Mises University at the Mises Institute. Um, the Fundish for Economic Education, they have also courses like that, and they're online courses. I mean, the Mises Institute has their Mises Academy. Uh, so studying a little Austrian economics, because I think that as soon as you you get it, and it's fairly quick, because it's, it's so easy to understand in a sense, and it's, it, it's intuitive. Mm -hmm. And when you start to realize how the economy actually works, then that that allows you to uh, peer through the fog in a sense, right? That you, you, you get to understand Stuff how things logically. actually, yeah. yeah, and how, and how things work. And mm -hmm. you can also start to wonder why doesn't it work the way I think it should work. I mean, that's even, even more important that it should work this way because I understand the economy, but it doesn't. Why is that? But it is because something is messing it up. I mean, there is some influence from something else that you might not be seeing. And the unseen is, is probably more important than the seen because everybody sees what is seen. But we can't see what, what is hidden unless we have this sort of framework to understand what is going on. Well said, beautiful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fair. Um, well, I hope to you know have you back sometime, maybe in the future for, you know, I don't know, maybe a, a, a discussion uh, with other uh, discussion partners. Um, it was really insightful. Thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks for having me. You too. Okay, Pierre. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.